Welcome back. Dan Ralph Miller with you for the Freeze Guard Fellowship Society. You're watching Freeze Guard TV. Now let's take a look at the Fellowship's lunar calendar and just why it is we call this month Easter month. As it turned out, Christianity borrowed the name of their holy day, Easter, from the pagans of Northwest Europe. Of course, the Christian Easter is the observance of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But Easter, or Yostere, was originally the name of a single month in the lunar calendar of the Anglo or Saxon tribes of Britain. A festival named Ostara may have also been celebrated by some Germanic tribes, at least on mainland Europe, around the time of the vernal equinox, uh, roughly March 21st or later. Now before Christianity, the Nordic tribes used various calendars, depending on who and where they were, the growing season, local climates, celestial events, and other local conditions and traditions. They all told the month by the moon. But the one month that all Germanic tribes seem to have held in common was the month of Yule, or Yuletide, observed at some time over the winter solstice, on the shortest day of the year. That all the various Germanic and Nordic tribes call the month of winter solstice by the same name speaks to the importance of Yule to the ancient calendar. Now by the end of the so-called Viking era, around 1100 or so, most of the Germanic tribes had either adopted the solar-based, Roman-inspired calendar of the Christian Church, or had taken the ancient Nordic names of the months and applied them to uh, the same or a similar solar calendar. But hundreds of years earlier, around the 7th century, an Anglo-Saxon chronicler, a devout Christian named Bede, described a lunar calendar then being used by local pagan tribes. Bede left to us the names of the lunar months and a few of the rules of their calendar system. Now in modern English, the word month comes from the Old English monath, which is a turning of the moon, or a full lunar cycle, from full moon to full moon, or new moon to new moon, a period of almost 30 days. A lunar year is usually defined as 12 lunar months, about 356 days or so. Of course, the true solar year, on the other hand, from one autumnal equinox to the next, for example, is 365.25 days. Now the difference between a solar year and a lunar year is, is therefore about nine days. Uh, the lunar year is a little shorter and the solar year is a little longer. So after about usually three years or so, this difference adds up to nearly a month, requiring uh, the addition of a kind of leap month to the calendar. Of course, it's not really an addition, but we're just observing 12, or 13 full moons between, say, one winter solstice and the next. Now, Bede wrote in the 7th century that this 13th leap month was added to the pagan calendar over the summer solstice in those years with 13 moons. Now, but four or five hundred years before Bede, in the first century of the Common Era, a Roman statesman and explorer, Tacitus, wrote of his journeys into the Germanic homelands. Tacitus states that the tribes observed full moons and new moons as the most auspicious times for any undertaking, suggestive of lunar calendars, perhaps. Hints of the ancient lunar calendar are also given in Iceland's poetic and prose eddas, written sometime between the 10th and 13th centuries of the Common Era. In the poetic lay called Voluspa, for just one example, the moon is called Artali, or the year counter, sometimes translated as the teller of time. So the use of lunar calendars in ancient Europe is truly ancient. The Nebra disk, discovered in 1999 in Germany, is an extraordinary artifact. Dated from the 15th or 16th century BC, the disc is mankind's oldest known depiction of the heavens. Showing a crescent and full moon against a field of stars, it's undoubtedly a visual guide to an observational lunar calendar using the Pleiades constellation as its signpost. 
<clears throat> this constellation is also called the Seven Sisters among mariners and was known as Frigga's Hens by some of our ancestors. The crescent moon appears close to the Pleiades, as pictured on the disk, once every two or three years, indicating that a thirteenth leap month is to be observed on those years. So, taking into account the precession of the equinoxes, uh, which is a subject we can delve more into later, back when the Nebra disk was first manufactured in or about 1600 BCE, the lunar alignment with the Pleiades occurred at the end of January, or start of February. By the second century of the Common Era, the lunar alignment with Frigga's hens occurred at the end of February, and by the time Bede was writing, in the 6th or 7th century, this alignment was occurring in early March. Of course, uh, these days, in fact this year, it's occurring just uh, in a couple of days, uh, on Sunday in fact. Now the full moon on the disk is the moon's next close brush with the Pleiades, always occurring a full nine moons, or nine months later, uh, these days, that would be the Yule full moon. So the Nebra disk, as it happens, is mankind's oldest lunar calendar guide, depicting a calendar of the exact same kind that was described by Bede 2,000 years later. And put into practice, as I have done since 2002, the two calendars are indistinguishable. I'll explain more in the future as to the implications of the Nebra disk for a modern reconstruction of a traditional Northwest European lunar calendar. It suggests an aeon-spanning calendar system on par with any of the celestial calendars of the ancient world. So observe the moon's brush with the Pleiades this Sunday night. Look for Frigga's hens, high in the south-southwest in the sky just after sundown. A small knot of six or seven stars, depending on conditions. And here's a pointer. Three stars of Orion's belt, uh, who some call Thor, point almost in a straight line directly at the Pleiades, which is a tiny little cluster. Uh, we also call them Frigga's hands. Now, the alignment of the crescent moon with the Pleiades constellation, as pictured on the Nebra disk, will occur... Sunday, March 30th, 2009, about 4 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, this means, for example, uh, we have forecast clear skies that night, so I'll be out Sunday night. Most places in North America, the ve best viewing will undoubtedly be the evening of Sunday, March 29th. Uh, some of our uh, brethren in Australia will perhaps uh, get the best view of the phenomenon, albeit upside down compared to the Nebra disk. Um, certainly, I think uh, folks in Western Europe should probably join us in North America checking it out on Sunday, March 29th. So more on traditional Nordic astronomy, the study of ours, and the Fellowship's lunar calendar in our next episode. For the Freethgard Fellowship Society and Freethgard TV, all the best to you and yours. We'll see you then.